As we heard this morning, trade is a big part of Australia's agricultural you know, landscape production. And today I'm really going to talk about the way that trade is occurring is changing. Um, and the way that we trade agriculture and food products um, is evolving. We're seeing developments in our food system that are akin to developments that we've seen in other sectors of the economy, particularly in electronics. So thinking the iPhone, thinking Dell. And what we basically see is that you know, trade is increasingly occurring in these things that we call global value chains. Um, and that production of any one good, of the food that we finally eat or the clothes that we wear, um, occurs in multiple different countries and not just in the one location. These global value chains are creating a whole range of new opportunities for the Australian agricultural sector. And one that it's been well placed and has been taking advantage of um, over time. But at the same time, they pose a number of challenges um, and also risks. So today, what I'm going to focus on is really presenting an overview of you know, why trade is changing, why we're seeing some of these developments, um, and how we go about thinking about it and measuring it from, I guess, a, a, an analyst type of point of view. Um, then I'm going to put Australia into context of, of this system, of these global value chains, and really take an industry or macro view, as Serena said, um, and with some good detail that we'll hear to follow. Then lastly, I'm going to detail some of the benefits that we're seeing from participating in global value chains um, and also some of the risks. Um, as Serena said, this work is primarily derived from work that I was involved with at the OECD um, and now I'll present it mainly focusing on the Australian context. So how is trade changing and why are we seeing the development of global value chains in agriculture and food sectors? Well, really, there's been two main driving forces um, behind these. And, and one is really this consumer story that we heard about this morning. And consumers are demanding um, products, um, no longer just these bulk commodities. Um, and this demand for products basically means that we were after different attributes in our food. Um, think about traceability, stamps on eggs or fruit, hormone-free beef, <coughs> organic products, carbon neutral wine, you know, the fishery to Patagonia of two fish that we saw before. So this changes the, the nature of the product itself. It's no longer a commodity, but it's a product. Um, the other main aspect has been technological changes, particularly in food manufacturing, which has led to this unbundling of supply. And what do I mean by unbundling? Um, and the best way to describe that is really an example. Um, so you might see a packet of noodles um, produced in China. Um, those noodles rely on flour that was milled in Indonesia, that was derived from wheat grown in Australia, and that was combined with a whole range of different inputs from oils to plant extracts and, and so forth from around the world. Um, these noodles may end up in Europe and where they're ultimately consumed. So in other words, this product that we see in our supermarket shelves or what we buy when we come home is produced in different parts from all across the world. So it's not produced in, in one location anymore. And so this unbundling has led to a chain of production being created. GVCs also have, or global value chains, have had an impact on the sectors themselves. So they've had a flow through impact. And the research that we've done has demonstrated that getting into global value chains has a number of benefits for the sector um, in terms of its growth, and so in terms of its overall production growth and its growth in exports. Um, and this is really about the, the spillovers that are created from you know, use of better technology, but also greater certainty and in incentives to invest. And Dion will talk a little bit later on about how this works at a practical level um, for, for an individual producer. But at the same time, despite these benefits on offer, global value chains are also more costly to access. They rely on a wider range of inputs to gain access, um, and often these are in terms of services. Um, and again, Tina will talk a little bit later on about some of the services that are required to actually access these, these global value chains and to gain access to consumers overseas. They also rely on imports, and one of the key findings is that imports of products are a key underpinning to export competitiveness. And so I'll run through some of the dynamics of this um, during my talk. So global value chains, I've mentioned the word or the term now, the three words a few times. What am I talking about when I'm talking about global value chains? Well, global value chains just represent this notion I mentioned before that 
Food is no longer grown and transformed into a final product in the one location. It occurs in several different places across the world, such as that wheat and noodles example from before. The notion is inherently picked up in these country of origin labels that we use here in Australia for our food. Um, in this case, it depicts the amount of food in terms of physical quantities that go into what we eat and we see on our supermarket shelves. But for our analysis, for trade, what we're really interested in is, is dollars. And so we're picking apart the, the trade values or the gross trade flows that we have into different sources of, of money. Where does that value come from? And to do that, we need to look, up, look at this notion of trade and value added. And what trade and value added really tells us, it just tells us where, you know, if we see a $10 trade flow, where does that $10 actually originate? Who earns an income from that? And so we extract out the, ver the portion that's a return to land, labour or capital within Australia compared to that which is derived from land, labour and capital from other countries. Um, and that gives us our ability to say, well, how much of it is Australian, how much of it's foreign, and where does it go once it leaves our shore? <coughs> to do that, we need to gain an understanding of not only agriculture's place in this, but its place in relation to all different industries in the economy and all the different industries in the economy in the world. So we need to know essentially the whole network of interconnections that occur within a broad economic system. And so I'm just going to briefly describe here in a, in a stylized um, example with, with two countries. And if we think about agriculture, agriculture, agriculture production brings with it land for labour and the capital. And we use inputs from international markets, so imported inputs and also domestic inputs, to produce a product. And that product we can sell directly to our domestic consumers, perhaps like in fruits and vegetables, or we can sell into our domestic processing sectors. We may also sell this across to country B in terms of exports and export it into their processing sector, um, or alternatively we could also send it to their consumers. But our processing sectors will also do a range of exporting activities and selling activities. They'll sell it to our domestic consumers, but they'll also sell it internationally, in this case into country B, either as inputs into country B's processing um, sector or directly to, to country B's consumers. Then country B's processing sector will also have its own linkages. It will sell the products internationally or to its own consumers. When we think about trade and the overall network, we actually have a multitude of other linkages. There are more than just two countries. There's a whole range of different countries out there in different sectors. So it's really a network of linkages that we're looking at. So there's a lot of information, a lot of data to sort through. Um, to gain, just to simplify this whole picture into something that's more digestible, we focus on three different relationships um, that are occurring in this trade network. The first is this backward linkages. But what we're interested in is looking at how much foreign value underpins our own exports. So if we observe a $10 export from, the, from Australia, how much of that came from other countries? The other linkage we're interested in is the forward linkages. And so when we're thinking about that, we want to know where our exported value ends up. So how much of our value added ends up in another country's exports? So in that example, it tells us, say, how much of Australian wheat is in Indonesian flour exports. The last linkage or relationship that we're interested in is really the end point, the, the foreign final demand. You know, how much of our production ends up in the consumer's overseas um, shopping baskets. So using these concepts, we can describe the trading landscape. <coughs> so starting at the, the global level. One thing when we look at the linkages in the agriculture and food trade, um, and in this case I'm focusing on those forward linkages, so how much of exports of agriculture and food products are getting re-exported by another country? Um, and we find a couple of interesting facts. The first one we find is that over, over time, trade in global value trains has been growing, um, and it's been growing relatively fast. Um, and relatively stable compared to particularly other goods in, in the other sectors of the economy. We also notice that traditional kind of intra-regional links, so countries generally trade with countries closer to them. Australia trades a lot with New Zealand, they're similar to us, they're right next door, 
Um, Canada, the US, they trade a lot with each other. Again, Simlin right next door. Um, this trade is growing rather quickly, and this is shown by these blue bars. But when we look at trade within global value chains, the thing that we notice is that trade between countries in different regions, so the red bar here, so this would be Australia trading with Europe or Australia trading with um, North America, is growing much faster. So our global system is becoming more global over time, and so our linkages are expanding. That said, at the same time, we're seeing concentration in different parts of the market. And we're seeing this evolution of hubs in, in global value chains across um, the world. And in particular, we, say, we see these hubs are occurring around China and Europe, and within Europe mainly with Germany. Overall, China is the most active player in global value chains both as a seller of inputs into other countries' exports, so in terms of those forward relationships, and as a buyer of produce for use in its own exports, so in terms of those backward relationships. Between 2004 and 2014, China was, was responsible alone for 21% of the total growth in global value chain trade. Um, and when we look at it, if we sum up just the, the top six countries in this list, they account for almost 45% of that growth. So we're seeing a concentration at various points in these supply chains. Similar things are seen on the buying side of the market. So this is, if you think about the selling, you know, who's selling for, for use and exports, where China really begins to dominate. So despite having multiple suppliers and multiple buyers, we're getting a concentration at different points. When we look at how Australia fits into this, this global importance of China is replicated for Australia. Um, if we look backwards, so we look at who's supplying inputs into our own exports, around 10% of our total gross value of trade is represented by foreign value added. So about 10, for every $10, $1 we take from international markets or international suppliers. That is, our exports are underpinned by our imports. China is our largest supplier and supplies around 1.4% of our gross value of agriculture and food exports. Um, the US, Japan and Europe are also important and so here is ARE which is the United Arab Emirates and that's in terms of fuel and, and basically um, energy inputs. And the other important linkage we have here is New Zealand um, and that is really dominated by linkages to our dairy sector. So New Zealand imports enable our exports of dairy products. Um, and so they're an important underpinning of our international competitiveness um, in the dairy sector. So without New Zealand imports, we wouldn't be able to export as well as we do. When we look forward from our market, we see that around 21% of our exported value gets re-exported by other countries. Um, and again, here China stands out as a key link. So China alone re-exports 4% of our total export domestic value. Um, and what this means really is that our first market is often not our last market. So our bilateral relationship may be the first step into a broader network of trade. So demand for Australian exports is driven by both improvements in our own market access in this bilateral sense, but what it's also underpinned by is the market access that exists between our trading partners and the rest of the world. For the sector overall, Australian GVC participation in this form has grown pretty steadily over time, as I mentioned before. Um, but it has moved in contrast to what we're seeing in trends in other sectors, where we're seeing both trade value and also trade within GVCs falling. Um, and this is occurring in other sectors for a, a range of regions. Some of the, the challenges that were flagged in, in this morning's sessions around slow economic growth post global financial crisis. Um, an increase in protectionism globally um, around different trade measures, more frictions to trade. Um, we've also got more uncertainty around trade. Um, and in particular for non-agricultural goods, industrialisation of China. So China is now buying more products from itself because it can produce more products itself. When we look at some of the benefits um, from participating in this form of trade, we see that for the Australian agriculture sector, this increasing engagement in global value chains has really promoted employment growth. And so we can break up employment growth into different sources. We can think about employment that's driven by trade, 
and driven by servicing the domestic economy, so producing food for us to eat and clothes for us to wear. And what we see between 2007 and 2014 is that with this continual drive of increased productivity in the sector, the number of jobs that are created in just feeding our domestic population has fallen, and that's this green bar here. So we need less jobs, less people to feed our domestic population because we produce more with less, essentially. But this has been pretty much entirely offset by growth in trade within global value chains, um, which is depicted here as intermediate exports. These are inputs into other foreign processing sectors. Um, and so we see this is pretty much offsetting the entire amount. And we also see a growth when we add the blue and the red bars of, of total trade. And so what this means is that, you know, it's been able to lead to a small increase in overall employment. Um, but also it demonstrates that, you know, our importance as a supplier into markets, so for example, the wheat example going into to flour milling overseas, is being of a benefit to us. That j just because we're not exporting final products doesn't mean that we're not benefiting significantly from global value chains. Um, the growth that we're seeing, particularly in this intermediates trade or these inputs into to global value chains, has been enabled largely by services. And when we decompose the source of value that's created in our exports, around 25% of the total value of our exports comes from our services sectors. So services are critical underpinning, and so Tina will give an example of how services can underpin you know, your growth in trade and value. It also being driven largely by reductions in the global trading market distortions. Um, and over, since 2000, there's been a number of developments which have been beneficial to Australia's overseas external interests. Um, they've been the commitments under the Agreement on Agriculture at the WTO coming into full effect. Obviously China joining the WTO was a, a, a massive improvement in markets for us. Um, but also we've had a number of free trade agreements that have been signed over that period. The other thing that we notice about global value chains and participating in global value chains is that they've created new value adding opportunities. Um, in other words, they promote value adding to the primary or farm gate output as opposed as an alternative um, to value adding by moving down the, the value chain, so instead of moving downstream. And that's kind of picked up by that employment in intermediate production. The reason for this is really twofold. Um, the first has been this shift to trade in products. Um, while higher cost to produce, producing products with all these attributes, hormone free, you know, different kinds of organic and labelling, um, they are also, that's my wrapper, um, <laughs> um, they also require a number of different services um, and require another different inputs, often which are mostly created by domestic suppliers. So this creates jobs within Australia, akin to what going into downstream sectors does. The other aspect has been the unbundling of this food production. And so our exports can take advantage of this increased competition in food sectors across the world without having to actually compete with them ourselves. When we look globally, we see that a number of the benefits, so the, the total returns for countries that export <coughs> primary products, predominantly primary products, that specialise in that, earn an equivalent total economic return when you add up all sectors as those that export downstream processed products. So just to wrap up, because I'm, I'm out of time, while these benefits exist, global value chains also create a number of challenges for the Australian market. If we want to continue to grow these opportunities, if we want to continue to, to exploit and to gain, um, then there's a few aspects that, that we really need to, to focus on. And the first is that competitiveness is critical. On the domestic side, competitiveness of particularly domestic surface markets, services markets, sorry, is the key underpinning to our export performance. So things like R&D, on-farm services, logistics. Um, we need to continually to invest into new ways to meet consumer expectations. Access to foreign inputs is needed. Um, low trade barriers to imports are very important, um, including own sector imports. 
And so the reliance of the Australian dairy sector on imports from New Zealand is a, is a key example of that, where barriers to imports of New Zealand dairy products would adversely affect our own sector. On the policy side, um, because you know, our first market is not our last market, global value change can compound some of the effects of trade and, and distortions. Um, and they can compound both non-tariff measures and tariff measures. And so continued access to a freer global market overall, such as through the WTO, is particularly important, along with our free trade agreement strategy. So I've got two bells, I'll finish then. So thank you for your attention.